Hey everybody. So, analog horror is a genre of internet media that's become increasingly popular in recent years. The turn of the millennium saw the rise of the ARG, our alternate reality game, a vibrant style of narrative storytelling that uses a number of media formats to deliver a story framed as a real-world occurrence. Groundbreaking independent web series, like Marble Hornets, Ash Vlogs, and Post Content, narrowed the loose concept of the ARG down to a more video-centric style that flourished in the YouTube environment. And, in the second half of the last decade, an unusual subgenre of these series, the aforementioned analog horror, began to take root. Pioneered by early projects like Local 58, Analog Horror is a distinct style of ARG-esque web series that focuses on eliciting feelings of uneasy nostalgia for the golden age of local analog media, the late 70s to mid-90s. These projects very often incorporate elements of the obscure, disturbing, and paranormal into surprisingly accurate recreations of past media formats, and use them to tell unique and disturbing tales that might not have otherwise been possible. As you might be able to tell from the theme of my channel itself, this is something I too find particularly interesting. Whether it's a little chromatic aberration, some static and distortion, or the effects of a genuine analog machine, these endeavors to create a convincing facsimile of this media while simultaneously telling a compelling story is one of the most fascinating expressions of creativity the internet's ever seen. And tonight, upon request, I'll be embracing the spirit of the season and taking a deep look into an analog horror channel that's flown somewhat under the radar in the year and a half since its creation. Tonight, we'll be checking in to the Eventide Media Center. Now, before we take a look at the videos themselves, let's get some background on the channel. Eventide Media Center was created on December 28th of 2019, and since that time has accumulated a little over 400,000 views, with 9 public uploads. The series is directed and created by independent filmmaker Aiden Chick, who in the past created the Tempest short films and the Tempest miniseries, which included a number of other horror projects. These include Channel 7, a Local 58-inspired three-season series centered around the story of a Philadelphia-based local station that experienced frequent intrusions, Stargaze, a UFO-centric series inspired by classics like Everyman Hybrid, but with a unique spin, and Analog Archives, a smaller miniseries reminiscent of Channel 7. Many of these smaller short films and series take place in a larger interconnected universe, although it's sometimes unclear to what extent. Eventide Media Center is the latest in Chick's long sequence of media projects, and uploaded its first video on February 15th of 2020. The channel has, as of this writing, a little under 12,000 subscribers. In-universe, the Eventide Media Center itself is the visual media division of a library serving the community of Eventide Valley, a small town in Massachusetts. Despite this, the videos collected by the Media Center range chronologically and geographically through a number of times and locations throughout rural Massachusetts. Although, as we will soon find out, these are all included in the Greater Eventide area. The general content of videos uploaded by the EMC is public broadcasts and announcements of varying purpose, ranging from public service announcements to promotional clips to film reruns and more. The events documented in these films occurred from the mid-70s to the mid-90s, across the area surrounding Eventide Valley, and each has its own story to tell. Be warned, these videos contain a good deal of disturbing imagery. Warnings for disturbing visuals will be shown on screen, along with the timestamps to skip them. Now, let's take a look. The first video uploaded to the channel is entitled Unusual Architecture. It opens with a warning that the creation of so-called Penrose shapes are forbidden by state law and the Massachusetts Association of Architecture. The video then introduces itself with a title card, which also gives us its year of creation, 1989. We'll be collecting these dates as we go through the series and potentially creating a timeline of events once each video has been examined. 
With some visual aids, the video informs viewers that an impossible shape, also known as a Penrose shape, is a geometric construct that can't exist in normal space. After listing some common impossible shapes, the video contradicts its previous statement, claiming it is only the limitations of our psyche that makes these shapes impossible, something that can be bypassed by, quote, disregarding the limitations of our minds. The video details the works of M.C. Escher and the work of psychologist Lionel Penrose and his son Roger, all three of whom contributed to the public's knowledge of impossible shapes. It should be noted, this is real-world information. Concluding the first segment of the film, the video posits the concept of using impossible shapes to achieve perpetual motion. Then, taking on a darker tone, the video instructs viewers to open their minds and begins detailing the construction of a common impossible shape. As the background music grows steadily more uneasy, we are told to extrude a rectangular prism, place another prism perpendicular to the first, and place a third in its general vicinity. At this point, the video becomes obfuscated by static, with the words, the rotated object should completely disappear at this point, briefly visible. Finally, the video fades back in on the completed Penrose shape, just as a full rotational view of the shape is about to be given. However, as the shape begins to rotate, a strange fractal pattern is rapidly formed, and the video cuts. This video's meaning, or underlying story, is straightforward. It appears that the construction of a shape like this, while comprehensible to the trained minds the video describes, is not possible, either for the minds of viewers or the video itself, thus causing a break in perception. The warning at the beginning would seem to indicate that this can be a potentially dangerous effect if not done properly. The next video is entitled Ocean View Forecast. The video begins with the title card announcing a late-night Sunday forecast for the greater Massachusetts area. Notably, this video does not feature a year of creation like unusual architecture, but with some investigation a general date can be derived. Due to the way in which weekdays and days of the month vary across years, the specific weekday-month-day combination shown in the video can be used to pinpoint a year. Within the time frame of the Eventide Media Center's archives, the only two years on which June 27th fell on a Sunday were 1982 and 1993. Using temperature data shown for Boston in the video, and cross-referencing it with historical weather data from these two years, 1982 seems to be our best bet, although 1993 is still certainly possible. Now, back to the video. A few communities are listed among those being forecast, including Eventide Valley and Ashenfield, both of which will be important at a later date. But Misty Point is the area of interest for this section. The initial forecast seems uneventful, and a small ticker can be seen advertising tours of the Misty Point Lighthouse. However, things quickly begin to turn, as after a half hour break, the forecast returns, now predicting heavy thunderstorms and 95% humidity for Misty Point. The predictions become more dire and threatening, as viewers are instructed to remain in their homes. The weather worsens, with winds reaching dangerous levels and humidity creeping towards 100%. It's at this point the situation begins to seem less like bad weather, and more like something unnatural. The ticker at the bottom of the screen warns viewers, first to keep a three mile distance from the Misty Point Lighthouse and avoid coastal areas, then to evacuate and cover reflective surfaces, and finally to avoid looking at the Misty Point Lighthouse. The conditions worsen as the audio cuts out entirely, and the ticker messages become more bizarre. Avoid its gaze. Something is coming from the sea. There is something rising out of the waters. The deluge brings forth the light of the ocean. The lighthouse is glowing. The ticker begins to state that there is a face in before being cut off by static. A Doppler radar view shows a massive storm creeping inland across the US. Within the Doppler pattern, a face, presumably the one mentioned earlier, begins to form before the feed cuts once again. One final shot is shown of the Misty Point lighthouse amidst the storm, shining a purple beam through the fog. 
As the beam connects with the camera, the face from the storm can briefly be seen before the video ends. This video seems to tell the story of a supernatural phenomenon in which the sea, or something within the sea, becomes animate and possessed with malicious intent. The unknown force seems to take control of the lighthouse, causing it to emit the light of the ocean, which causes an unknown, presumably negative, effect on those who see it. The face in the storm seems to be a manifestation of this strange entity or force. What caused this, and what the aftermath was, is unknown at this point. Video number three is Nuclear Safety. Immediately we can tell this video is considerably older than the others we've seen so far. A very brief identification card, labeling the video as Emergency Reel A, approved 1970, confirms this. It can be assumed that, if this reel was shown at all, it would have been in the mid-70s at the latest. The video, apparently made by the Massachusetts Threat Defense Group, begins by instructing the viewer on nuclear safety. The video acknowledges the potential of nuclear attack, and begins to list some warning signs. These include alert signals for, quote, peacetime emergencies, and attack warnings for, quote, national attacks. A sample of each alert siren is played. Viewers are instructed to seek fallout shelters if the sirens are heard. The effects of a nuclear blast are listed in turn. A blinding flash of light, a heat wave, a blast wave, and finally, fallout. We are instructed to avoid looking at the flash, but that, at that point, heading for cover is meaningless and an individual should simply accept death. Up until this point, the video has adopted a preventative tone, but as it shifts towards discussing a nuclear aftermath, the video's tone becomes exceedingly dark. We are told that there simply is no aftermath, as full nuclear war is not survivable. Even fallout shelters, we are warned, may not be enough to protect you, as a grotesque and mutilated depiction of a human body is shown. The video states there is no way to prepare for or prevent such an occurrence, and that it is inevitable. One should, quote, mentally prepare and be ready for the eventuality. Those who aren't will be judged. As the video concludes, a mushroom cloud is shown, although it has been altered to appear strangely biological in nature. It should be noted that a number of slides are missing from the presentation, and their contents are unknown. This video is somewhat unique when compared to others on the channel, as it doesn't focus on the supernatural or paranormal. Rather, it simply describes the impossibility of survival should a real-world nuclear attack occur. In this way, it can be seen as even more frightening. Our next video is Deep Night. This is our first film to be sourced from right in Eventide Valley, the home of the Media Center, and it's being broadcast from the local WEVC-TV station. This video also has one of the least defined timeframes of almost any video in the EMC collection. No definite years, weather data, or weekday and month combinations can be seen throughout the entire length of the video. However, a time frame can still be established, in this case using the station ident card as a clue. The dash TV suffix indicates a full service analog station, something completely phased out circa 2009 due to the Digital Transition and Public Safety Act of 2005. However, this doesn't help us very much. Far more useful are the station's frequency and power output. A frequency of 475.8 MHz indicates an ultra-high frequency channel, and with that designation in mind, a 10 kW output would indicate an LPTV station, under FCC guidelines. LPTV, or Low Power Television, is a broadcasting service instituted by the FCC in March of 1982. 
Based on all of this, and the overall aesthetic style of the broadcast, we can deduce that Deep Night takes place somewhere in the mid-80s, no earlier than March 1982. Now, with that out of the way, let's look at the video itself. The video begins with WEVC signing off for the night. But strangely, instead of going off the air, the station begins a new segment called Deep Night at 3.26 a.m. Upcoming events include Penrose Fields and The Greenhouse, both references to other Eventide videos, both previous and upcoming. The schedule for tonight, as displayed in the programming block, is tripography. Notably, this is not an actual word, but assuming the phrase is derived from the Greek tripa and the suffix graphy, the term would loosely translate to the study of holes. The contents of the video are more straightforward than most. A number of CCTV feeds are shown and monitored for the appearance of strange holes in the ground, and the end of each feed shows a small analytic report of the quantity and growth of these holes for each location previously shown. The feeds progress through Torrent Park, Zenith Gardens, East King Street, and West King Playground, with steadily increasing numbers of holes and hole growth. East King Street is said to have possible seed growth, and brief footage of said seed growth is shown. The progression culminates in Region 5, the land surrounding the WEVC station itself, which is shown to have an extremely high concentration of holes. Before the feed cuts once again to the analytic report, we see strange one-eyed worm-like creatures rising from the holes and staring directly into the camera. A final update on the screen informs us that growth is nearly complete, at which point the program is ended, only six minutes having passed. This video is a bit more bizarre than the others. It appears to tell the story of some group or individual at the WEVC station who documents the formation and spread of the unusual hole formations shown in the broadcast, a practice known as tripography. It appears that, once the holes undergrow enough growth, they may begin to have seed growth, which could potentially be the reason for the appearance of the eye creatures towards the end of the video. This entire observation process is broadcast on WEVC, the local TV station, but at 3 a.m., long after the conclusion of its broadcast day and during a time when most would be asleep. Additionally, the broadcast lasts only six minutes before returning to its off-air state. It's unclear why this is, but it's possible this broadcast is designed for specific individuals who would know to tune in during that small window during the deep night. Although, why they would need to do this is unsure. The fifth video in the series is Midnight Movie. The video opens with a few advertisements and date temperature display as the recording cuts between channels. Again, the year is not shown, but using the weekday and date method from the Ocean View forecast, we can narrow the year down to 1989 or 1995. Weather data would indicate 1995, but it's a minor change and the video's aesthetic style, including cleaner lines, more muted colors and gradients, could be either era. We'll be going with 95, but this is certainly not confirmed. The video continues to flip around before arriving at Channel 8, where we are treated to the tail end of what appears to be a Golden Age monster film, catching a small glimpse of the final scene before the end. Once the film concludes, we see a mostly innocuous credit reel that lasts about two minutes. But after the credits finish rolling, things begin to turn as we see a memoriam dedicated to the members of the film company who lost their lives throughout late 1952 and 1953. The memoriam is revealed to consist of nearly every member of the cast and crew previously mentioned, all of whom seemingly met their end in 1953. At the very end of the memoriam, the name of the film, Attack of the Somberville Spiders, is shown, along with the date of production, 1953. Somberville is yet another in the collection of communities serviced by the Eventide Media Center. As the end credits conclude, the tape seems to rewind, looping back through the credits and to the previously unseen movie itself. For a few seconds, we glimpse the last moments of the film, in which a cameraman appears to be cowering in legitimate fear from a massive spider before the video concludes and a final ad rolls. 
The explanation for this video is surprisingly straightforward. The bulk of the story in this case occurred several decades prior to the broadcast itself. In 1952, the Somberville Film Company began production on their film, Attack of the Somberville Spiders. Through some unknown means, the group was able to either create or find gigantic versions of normal spiders for use in the film, foregoing special effects in favor of the real thing. As a result, most of the production company was killed before the film's conclusion, although the film still saw release. And then, over 30 years later, the film was shown in the dark morning hours of local Somberville TV. Moving into the final stretch of videos, we arrive at City Council. This video opens with the title card indicating that this is a recording of a City Council meeting for Old Gothsford, held October 1987. We are treated to a live video feed of the City Council chambers, and although the vocals are obfuscated, either intentionally or unintentionally, we can see a transcript at the bottom of the broadcast. A man identified as Mayor Smith begins with a summary of city resource allocations. Maintenance, education, and industrial development comprise less than half the budget, while the majority of the spending appears to be going towards excavation, for reasons that will be revealed soon. Mayor Smith discusses plans for the next quarter, including expanding on the excavation project, and upon hearing no questions, Mayor Smith passes the discussion to a man identified as Priest Osborne of the Gosford Church. Priest Osborne describes his dissatisfaction with the ongoing excavation, claiming the excavation project is encroaching on the church, interfering with services, and negatively impacting the community. In conjunction with his practical concerns, Osborne states the project, quote, goes against the Lord's wishes. He proposes to limit excavation spending, but is cut off by Mayor Smith, who disregards his concerns entirely. Smith goes on to introduce Lee R. Carlo, the leader of the excavation development project, who strangely is also the senior director of bioengineering. Carlo shows a map indicating the regions the project will be taking place in, indicating the project will cover a significant portion of Old Gosford. The excavation area seems to be strangely shaped. Closer inspection reveals it to be a massive silhouette, which, if stood upright, would be thousands of feet tall. Carlo assures a member of the city council that affected businesses will be compensated and continues to deliver more plans for expansion of the already massive project. Before he can continue, Priest Osborne can be heard shouting faintly that the excavation is unholy and those involved will be punished. At this point, Priest Osborne is presumably removed from the meeting. Throughout this segment of the video, faint rumbling can be seen and heard, growing steadily louder. To conclude, Carlos shows footage taken from the excavation site. First, a backhoe is seen digging, unearthing something that glows with a bright purple light and another video shows what appears to be a massive purple heart, glowing with the same light. Carlo describes the plans for the following months, including actions such as central pipeline construction and central cavity lift. He believes they will have 85% of the system exposed. By this time, the rumbling has begun to peak in intensity. The feed cuts back out to the central room, which is suddenly destroyed by a large shape emerging from the earth. In the final seconds of the broadcast, we see a wide shot of Old Gothsford, with a massive humanoid figure rising above it, then glaring towards the camera with glowing eyes. This video seems to tell the story of a strange discovery in the small community of Old Gothsford, and the misguided attempts to uncover it. A bizarre, massive humanoid creature is found to be lying beneath the town, and the city council begins a massive excavation project to dig it up. The project uncovers what appears to be the creature's circulatory system, and, based on the claims of the system being exposed and the central pipeline completed, it can be assumed the project now aims to harvest the bodily fluids of the creature for an unknown purpose. Many members of the town, Priest Osborne being one, strongly object to the project for obvious reasons. However, during the city council meeting, something occurs which seems to awaken the creature beneath the town, causing it to rise up and cause massive damage in the process. What happens next is unknown, but it almost certainly involves the destruction of Old Gothsford itself.
Our next video is Computer Graphics. The video opens with a logo for Interface Visions Incorporated, a company operating out of East Circuit, Mass. And a title card reveals this to be a demo reel from 1990. A circuit board rendered in old school demo scene style is shown, as the camera pans around it and introduces us to a number of services offered by Interface. The Animations and Visual Effects segment shows a sequence of three simple animations. Interestingly, all the animations shown have subtle circuit board elements, even in places they don't seem to belong. An ending card reads, All animations created from the visions and dreams of our dedicated employees. The next segment, Models, follows a similar pattern, detailing low-poly models with out-of-place circuit board elements. The final model, a computer, has a strange tube emerging from the back, which falls, causing the music to instantly stop as the segment concludes. All graphics, the video claims, are modeled after real-world observations. The final segment of the video is character models, which, according to the video, are, quote, accurately modeled after real participants. As the segment begins, we can see that each model appears to, in fact, be a member of the interface team, their bodies merged with computer components. Employee Bill Reed has a tube connected to the back of his head, resembling that of the earlier computer. Employee Steve Harriet has wires emerging from his mouth. Project manager Joe Gatesburg features the heaviest alteration. As maggots begin to crawl out of his eyes, the video cuts. The video returns to the circuit board graphic and pans out to a wide shot with the word motherboard visible. In the last few moments of the video, four beds can be seen, connected to the board as if they were circuit components, with three of the four beds occupied, presumably by the employees shown earlier. A card reads, Here at Interface, our visions become reality, and the video concludes with a memoriam to someone named Madison Gatesburg. The story in this one is surprisingly complex, although some segments of it have been pieced together by individuals in the video's comments section. It can be assumed that Interface Visions, the company behind the video, had three employees, Bill Reed, Steve Harriet, and Joe Gatesburg, the project manager. The sections of the video come in threes, three animations, three models, and eventually, three character models. Based on the statement, all animations created from the visions and dreams of our dedicated employees, it would make sense to say that each employee was responsible for one part of each segment. However, the method through which these were created seems anything but ordinary. Through some means, the men appear to have connected themselves with the computer system, becoming part of the computer from which the graphics were generated. The computer elements integrated into their bodies, as well as the final graphic of the three beds, indicates the men are now an integral part of the computer, like components on a circuit board. But this still leaves one question unanswered. Who is Madison Gatesburg? According to the memoriam, Madison died just one year before the demo's creation, and it's logical to assume she was the wife, or at least a close relative, of Joe, the man in charge of the project. The first animation shows a ball rolling towards a grave, presumably Madison's, and although it's difficult to see, the central processor in the large circuit board graphic has Madison's name printed on it. There's even an empty bed in the final sequence, Madison's bed. It's impossible to know what this all truly means, but a conceivable theory is that Madison is the computer itself. With her name printed on the central processor, it's conceivable that, upon her death, Joe Gatesburg conceived of some way to preserve her within Interface's computers. Contrarily, it could have been work on Interface's computers that killed her in the first place. Either way, she has a strong connection to the computer system as a whole, and it's possible she may have had some part in the three employees' eventual assimilation. The penultimate video in the collection is Oasis Greenhouse. It opens with the logo for the Botanical Foundation of Massachusetts, by whom the video was sponsored. We see a title card for the Oasis Greenhouse, bringing us back to Eventide Valley itself, as the video begins to list a series of plants housed at the greenhouse. Hydrangea macrophylla, used for transferable reproduction cells. Hibiscus rosa sinensis, used for its external stamen and nectar. 
Roystonia borinquena, used for its oversized palm leaves. Musa acuminata, used for its oversized stalks and roots. Hedera helix, used for its predatory tendrils. Dionea muscapula, used for base genetic code and carnivorous tendencies. The video then transitions into the local selection of botanical life, all of which originate in Eventide Valley. A plant labeled as Valvis concoctio, strongly resembling a human digestive system, is shown, apparently used for digestive fluids. Another plant is shown, Boda cerebro, identical to a human brain, its use listed simply as consciousness. At this point, the video cuts to an external angle taken on a handheld camcorder. The recording's date can be seen as 1993. In the exterior shot, a massive flytrap-esque plant creature can be seen, labeled Flora Amalgama, its use listed as protein production. Finally, the video cuts to what appears to be a human hand being absorbed into a vat of unknown liquid, as the word oasis appears on screen. We see several large cylinders of the liquid with the caption, Special fluid produced in the oasis is used for high energy protein synthesis, followed by, This fluid is used in energy drinks, protein bars, and other nutritious products. This video tells an interesting story. The oasis greenhouse, located in the mysterious Eventide Valley, has been collecting, and in some cases creating, various species of plants with a variety of purposes. While the uses of the flora may seem unusual at first, they make a bit more sense when you consider them as pieces of a final product. Transferable reproduction cells, oversized leaves, predatory tendrils, and, in the case of the flytrap, base genetic code and carnivorous tendencies. This final product would be the briefly seen flora amalgama, a taxonomic designation loosely translating to plant of many parts. The Oasis Greenhouse collected a variety of plants to engineer the amalgama, but this wasn't enough to reach their goal. To achieve their desired outcome, the Greenhouse created two more bizarre plants, Valvus concoctio, a plant functioning as a human digestive system, and Boda cerebro, a plant seemingly analogous to a brain. These plants would be used to give the amalgama digestive fluids and, most importantly, consciousness. It can be inferred that, in order to create these unnatural types of plant life, human beings were used in some capacity. The final goal of Flora Amalgama, as seen in its use section, is the production of a protein that, according to the closing captions of the video, is used in a variety of food products we consume on a daily basis. The most recent video in the Eventide archives is Fire, Danger. This video opens with the last few sections of an advertisement for saws, then transitions into the daily fire danger rating report for Ashenfield, another town in the greater Eventide area. The date is July 23, 1979, and the fire danger rating is very low, although close inspection can see the arrow slowly creeping towards moderate. A warning is given that a controlled burn will be conducted in the area. After a short break, we return on July 24th, just an hour or so before the controlled burn is supposed to start. The temperature has increased and the fire danger is now at moderate. Open fires are prohibited. A disclaimer about preventing forest fires comes on screen, followed by the mention of a ceremony starting at 3 o'clock. Visitors are advised to visit their local fire station soon, which becomes a direct command as the segment concludes. We cut back to the broadcast after the burn has begun. Footage of the burn is shown, and citizens not currently participating are instructed by law to seek shelter. The temperature is dangerously hot, and the fire danger has reached very high as we are warned to, quote, prepare for emergency action. Soon after, this controlled burn becomes a high hazard wildfire as footage of the fire can be seen ripping across the forest. The fire danger has become extreme, although there are no restrictions at this time. The final message of the now silent broadcast instructs all citizens to head to a local fire station if possible, claiming that, quote, you too can prevent wildfires. The final segment of the video shows a skeleton consumed by fire, followed by a shot of a massive skeletal creature, 
rising out of the flames. The story in this video could go a few different ways, but we'll discuss one of the most likely. The Ashenfield Fire Department is conducting a controlled burn of the surrounding woods. Controlled burns are usually beneficial to the local environment and safe if conducted properly. However, the fire department is making a strange choice. Controlled burns are almost universally done in the cooler months of the year, so as to prevent the fire from spreading out of control. The Ashenfield FD, on the other hand, is conducting the burn in the middle of summer, when the foliage is likely to be extremely hot, dry, and flammable. Almost as if a devastating inferno is the end goal. As the controlled burn approaches, citizens are advised to congregate at the local fire stations, not just for the burn, but for an unexplained ceremony. As the burn approaches, the requests for attendance become commands. When the burn commences, it quickly spins out of control as expected. Citizens are urged more strongly than ever to participate, even as the burn becomes a chaotic wildfire. But the purpose of the burn still remains unclear until the last few seconds of the video. Rising from the flames, we see the charred skeletal remains of some massive otherworldly creature, seemingly still alive but badly burned by the fire. The controlled burn was never the objective. It was the destruction of this creature. The burn was simply a cover, so as to not alarm the general populace. But obviously something went awry, likely due to the creature remaining alive despite being burned, and a massive wildfire was started. And even as the fire blazes on, the FD continues urging citizens to participate, saying that they too can prevent wildfires. The Eventide Media Center is a fascinating and exceedingly well-made analog horror experience, one that I would highly recommend. The stories contained within its videos, as you might have guessed by now, are not related to each other in any meaningful capacity. Although each takes place in the Eventide Valley area from the mid-70s to 90s, the series acts like more of an anthology, a group of disconnected horror stories with a somewhat consistent theme that each tell their own self-contained tale. An interesting common thread I noticed while documenting each video is the idea of going too far, or doing something that shouldn't have been done, and the consequences that result. From creating a twisted plant creature in Oasis Greenhouse, to digging up a strange humanoid in City Council, to creating reality-defying structures in unusual architecture, a number of the Eventide videos usually seem to involve the corruption of some natural law or process, and the dire repercussions faced by those responsible. And, in the end, although the stories aren't related, they're all collected and archived by the Eventide Media Center, which seems to always be there as some sort of enigmatic, passive observer. From an out-of-universe perspective, it's a very well-crafted and well-executed style of visual storytelling. The horror elements manage to be legitimately unsettling, and the anthology style is one that's very rarely seen in the ARG landscape. In a way, it's a breath of fresh air. And hopefully, as the year begins to draw to a close, we can all look forward to seeing the next video the Eventide Media Center manages to dig up. Thanks for watching, and happy Halloween. <laughs>